Good morning, church. Betty McMurray, do you have a power word for me? Sorry, she got halfway through the sentence, didn't she? Just halfway. It's all right. She's going to be sitting there. So, wow, there are a lot of cards. Yeah, there's prizes right there, right there. Boy, look at all these. We just stuff, stuff, stuff the bullet. Look at here. Look at here. Betty, wait. I, there's more. You know, if the kids only knew this, they would raid the pulpit after hours. <laughs> Well, it doesn't matter if there's a name on here. Lena, L I N A, Lena. She lives in Korea. She went back. This is going to cost a lot of postage to send her one of those. That's right. That's right. That's right. Oh, I don't think Kevin's here today. Kevin? Kevin? It's going to go back to Joshua. Just watch. Oh. Emily. Why is it that the children that came last week are not here this week? There are other children here this week. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, are you kidding me? Okay. Well, stand right here. Stand right here because Joshua, Joshua, would you just go sit with Betty and figure out one of these prizes? Just take, don't take them all to your seat. You get one. You now go talk to Betty about it. Man, I don't know. The, your parents are going to have to build a bigger house. <clears throat> um, the power word this morning for those of you uh, young people that are counting is kingdom, K-I-N-G-D-O-M, kingdom. So you can write that down every time that I s say that word and you hand it to Betty or me at the end of the service and we'll do that. And this morning, um, our message, you know that we've been... Um, Several weeks ago, I decided to preach a sermon on the Lord's Prayer, and as I got into it, it just became multiple sermons. So thank you for taking this journey with me as I really try to understand what the Lord is saying to us as he teaches us to pray. So let's pray the Lord's Prayer um, together, if you would, with me. Um, and close your eyes if you've memorized it. The lyrics are on the screen if you haven't, and let's pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today we're going to talk about just three words, thy kingdom come. What do we mean when we pray these three words, thy kingdom come. Well, first, thy is Old English for your. We're addressing God and using the second person possessive pronoun for you English buffs that are here. Um, in other words, we're talking to God about a kingdom that belongs to God when we say thy kingdom come, your kingdom, Lord, come. Now, first flush, it may seem like we're ordering God around like a, a parking attendant or a traffic cop that says, you here. But I don't think that's the sense of how Jesus would teach us to pray. We're not saying to God, you come. Um, it's more like it seems to me like an invitation to God for God and his kingdom to come and be, be established in and over my life. Um, but more of that in just a moment. The second word, kingdom. What is a kingdom? You know, a lot of us use that word kingdom, especially in the church context, almost interchangeably with country or nation. But a kingdom is different than a country and a nation. Um, obviously, the kingdom we're talking about in the Lord's Prayer is a kingdom not of human origin. It's not a kingdom with castles and moats and knights and ladies in waiting shining armor, all that stuff. It's not that kind of a kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. It is God's kingdom. So when we think of that word kingdom, uh, it actually comes from the Greek word basilica. Isn't that interesting? Basilica. Now basilica, the Greek word uh, that in English we pronounce basilica, uh, actually means 
royal power or kingship or dominion. So isn't it interesting that, that a word that is translated royal power is also the same word that in the Roman Catholic Church is used for special churches that the Pope has set apart as a special basilica. We think of the most famous uh, and well-known basilicas, of course, St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, but there are basilicas around the world. Basilica, center of power and authority, it seems interesting to me, very interesting to me, that, um, that that word basilica is used in both of those ways. Very few of us uh, here this morning have lived in a kingdom. All right, how many of you have ever lived in a kingdom? Raise your hand. Okay. Those of you that have lived in um, the British Commonwealth, that's not really a true kingdom. I mean, they say it is. So we'll give them that. But um, the queen does not have ultimate power in her uh, kingdom. Who does? It's parliament. It's prime minister. That, that's where the source of power is in the United Kingdom. So we call it a kingdom. But a kingdom uh, usually has one ultimate power leader. And that would be the, the king or the queen. Um, I have spent only a couple of weeks in a true monarchy, and I'm going to tell you the story if you're up for it. I went to a mission trip, on a mission trip, to the only kingdom in the South Pacific. It's the kingdom of Tonga. Now, I didn't see the king of Tonga, but shortly after I arrived on the island um, in the capital city of Nuku'alofa, so impressed I can still say that. Um, uh, we went over to the palace and we looked through the, the uh, metal fence that was around um, the palace. And so we saw the palace. And then we went and did our work of building a school for the Adventist uh, church and school that was there. Um, but I, I will tell you that I'll, although I only saw the palace, I didn't see the king, I did see the queen. And I had an audience with her along with several hundred other people. <laughs> Let me tell you the story. It's actually kind of interesting. This was not part of our itinerary, and I'm the only one on our mission group that actually got to see the queen. Um, it was uh, Sabbath afternoon. Every, everybody on the island of Tonga that, that goes to church goes to church on the same day. I said it was Sabbath afternoon. What the calendar said was that it was Sunday afternoon. Let me explain. Tonga is the only place in the world where Seventh-day Adventists worship on Sunday. Now, it's not because they're less committed, less dedicated Seventh-day Adventists. It's not because they've given up the faith and don't believe that the Seventh-day Sabbath is the sacred day of the Bible. It's not about that. What happened was the international date line runs almost, if, if it stayed straight, it would run right through the kingdom of Tonga. But you can't have an international date line running right through one country. And so the international date line jogged, if you look on a globe, to the left of the kingdom of Tonga. Well, Tonga does most of their business with Australia, New Zealand, which was on the other side of the international date line. So one day the king got a wise idea and he said, why, why are we doing this? Why the, the line could be on either side of our kingdom so I am going to say now that the line is on the other side. That's what kings can do. They can just say so. And so somehow it got communicated. Now you look on your globes and the international date line comes down and it now jogs to the right. Well, what did that do to the calendar in Tonga? What it basically did was uh, shifted everything by a day. So now what used to be Sunday was now Monday. And what used to be Sabbath is now Sunday. Now, in Tonga, um, all of the other Sunday-keeping churches, Methodism is big in the islands. In fact, the king and queen were uh, Methodists. Um, uh, the Mormons have a, uh, a large presence there. The Roman Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, other Protestant organizations, Anglicans, etc., have a significant presence in Tonga. 
And so when the calendar got changed, what did all the Sunday keeping churches do? They didn't want to keep worshiping on Monday. Besides, the king had told everybody they have to go working on Monday. So they went over to Sunday. What did our dear brothers and sisters in the Adventist faith do? They said, no king is going to tell us what day is holy. We serve God, not man. We are not going to change anything. We're going to continue to worship on the same day, the seventh day Sabbath, and the king can call it whatever he wants. We're going to keep worshiping. The problem is now that is Sunday. <laughs> and so uh, I talked to the pastor on Tonga, had a, such an engaging conversation with him. He uh, is not Tongan. He was from one of the other South Pacific Islands. He's so frustrated. He says, evangelism here is impossible. You try to preach the Sabbath, and it doesn't make a lick of sense to anybody. You need to change your head about the Sabbath, but you don't change your day. It was great. So anyway, it was Sunday afternoon, but we had been worshiping on the Sabbath, the Tonga Sabbath Sunday. And uh, so after potluck, we were chatting. <clears throat> the church... Uh, and school is on the main road that goes uh, through the kingdom of Tonga, it runs along um, the sea. And uh, um, suddenly down the highway ways, we heard music. So we're all curious. We're looking down and there's a parade. It's coming right down the highway and people are holding banners and there's some people with musical instruments or guitars, ukuleles, things like that. And they're all singing and they're marching down toward the center of the capital city of Nuku'alofa. Well, I'm, I'm looking at this parade going by, and I, I said um, to the people that I was with, I said, what is the parade about? Even though the, the banners were all in a different language, and so I couldn't understand. And, and they said, we don't know. And uh, so I thought, well, the people in the parade must know. And there's just these throngs of people walking, and every once in a while, banners. And so I go out, and I start walking in the parade, and I'm asking these people. And somebody, I find somebody that speaks English. I said, what's the parade about? They said, well, we're all Mormons, and we're going to see the king. So I said, I can be a Mormon for a while. <laughs> so I fell right in with them. And it was maybe a couple of more miles down to where the palace was, and so I was just, I didn't know their music, and I, you know, didn't know really why they were going to see the king, but I figured if they were going to see the king, I'd go do that with them. So we got to the uh, beautiful, ornate uh, gates that opened up onto the palace grounds, the guards swung the gates open, and hundreds of Mormons and Jim McMurray go walking into the palace grounds. It was raining that day, and so we sat down. Um, most of the people that were there just, uh, you can't stand. Um, you have to sit because that's how you display reverence and honor. And so they all sat down in the sopping wet grass. I found a little tiny retaining wall, and I, I quickly found a place and sat there so I didn't have to sit in the wet grass. And I was intrigued by what happened next. Um, they had brought these uh, gifts to give to the king. The king was not in residence, and so it was the queen that we were meeting with. And they had this um, just stacks and stacks of firewood. That was one of the gifts that they were giving the queen. And another was a wooden um, uh, container box with a huge hog, boar hog, in this container. And so they have, she comes out on the porch and she has somebody that is her spokesman that does all of the negotiating and speaking. And so, um, he, you know, they, they give the firewood and, and the spokesman says, um, all, all of this is in another language, but thankfully I was sitting close to somebody that knew English and so she kept cluing me in. That's what was happening. Not enough. Well, here's this great swine for the, <laughs> for the king's household. Thank you, not enough. Okay, and they gave her several thousands of dollars of cash. And, um, and so there was this negotiation back and forth. And finally, they got to the place where the king was, the queen on behalf of the king was willing to accept the gift of the Mormon faith. You know, it was interesting. A couple of years ago, I actually had a Mormon in my Uber car. And I told him this experience that I had in Tonga because he was also Tongan. He was a Tongan Mormon. And I told him about my experience. He says, oh, and he gave me exactly the year that that happened. I had assumed it happened every year. Oh, he said, no, the Mormons wanted some kind of favor from the palace. And so it just happened once, and I happened to be there. So that was a, that was a good thing. Um, finally, you know, the queen accepts the donation. And then there's 
dancing and uh, singing and um, people making speeches, and this went on and on through the rest of the afternoon. And, and I just felt so intrigued and delighted to be in on all of this. Um, it's interesting that you can't go swimming on the beach in Tonga on Sunday. Why? The beach is there. Why can't you go swimming on Sunday? Because the king said, it's a sacred day. We don't go swimming on Sunday. Well, I'm a tourist. I don't, I, I, the king said, you don't go swimming. So we had actually, people in our group were saying, hey, why don't we go out swimming uh, in the afternoon? Nope, it's Sunday. The king said no. This is how kingdoms operate. Kingdoms have kings who have ultimate authority and power. And so, uh, because the king had said it's not permitted, it's not. Why? Doesn't matter why. The king has said it. That's all. That's how kingdoms operate, right? You don't have an appeal to your elected representative to go see if we can change the rules or anything. No, the king said it. It's a kingdom. That's that. So a kingdom is not a republic. It's not a democracy with an elected president or prime minister. Earthly kingdoms, as a matter of fact, can either be benevolent or not. You've heard this term benevolent dictatorship. That's a king that cares, has compassion about his subjects or her subjects, and is generous with people that live in the kingdom. But other dictatorships are just dictatorships. They are severe, very restrictive. People can die uh, very readily if they cross up with the uh, dictator, the king, whoever it is. And, um, and oftentimes, earthly kingdoms become um, very selfish places to live. Often in Scripture, when the, when the term kingdom is used, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, most often in the New Testament, that is referring to the church. Because God's kingdom on earth, because who's the king of this earth right now? It's not God. The devil took that place. And God is redeeming us and and will establish his kingdom, but it is in a future event. And so the church becomes the place that is God's kingdom on earth. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. So he is, the, in, in a sense, the king of this place. So this is turf that is established by God on earth. It is his church. Um, the third word, come, thy kingdom Come. Now, the word can be used as an imperative. This sometimes you see at the supermarket where a mother or a father will say, come now. Well, if that kid keeps wandering, you know, away in the opposite direction, he's in, he or she is in big trouble, isn't he? That's an imperative command. Come. You come. But that's not how it's used in the Lord's Prayer. Um, come can you be used more as an invitation, right? Come. Come. Come sit at my table for potluck. Come over to my house this uh, evening and we'll play some table games. Come, come enjoy my hospitality. Um, that's more of the sense of that word come in the Lord's Prayer. But there's a third way of looking at it and it's the way that I think that the Lord intended when he gave us the Lord's Prayer. Not an imperative, you come. Not an invitation, I invite you to come. But more a, a use of the word come is a sense of submission to God's will, sense of surrender. In other words, God who is sovereign over all things and over me, may your plan see fruition and reality. In other words, I surrender to you. I ask you to come in a sense of coming and living your life through me. May it be according to your will, that kind of come. I surrender to your plan, your will. So to pray thy kingdom come is to pray for God's reign and his rule to come. Now, it seems to me as I was praying and looking at, at this passage that when we say thy kingdom come, we're really saying to God three different things in terms of how his kingdom comes. First is um, personal. Um, second is pervasive. I'll, I'll say more about this in a moment. And the third is um, prophetically coming in the future. So 
Um, praying thy kingdom come personally is to pray God's rule and reign to be, to be experienced in my surrendered heart and life right here, right now. Come, occupy the throne of my heart. Praying thy kingdom come pervasively, I pick that word because it starts with P, but it is, uh, it is praying for God's rule and God's reign to be experienced in our community, in our nation, in other nations. It has the sense of outreach and evangelism and missions. Lord, come. May, may people outside of myself also find a walk with Jesus and a surrender to him. And praying thy kingdom come prophetically is to pray for God's rule and God's reign to be experienced ultimately as God sets up his kingdom in the future and um, rules his entire universe from this place. So give me a moment to um, talk about thy kingdom come as a prayer that is personal. It's ultimately a prayer that God be enthroned in my heart. And in order for that to happen, we must dethrone ourselves because we're born into sin and selfishness and self gets enthroned on the, on the throne of our life really quickly and early in our life. So we need to dethrone something in order to invite God to set up his kingdom and his rulership, his leadership in my life. I have to dethrone my lust. I have to dethrone my ambition. I have to dethrone my selfishness, my craving for wealth, my ambition for recognition or popularity, quest for power and control. Those things have to be dethroned if we're going to invite God's kingdom to come and for God to set up his throne in my own personal life. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, it's an invitation for God to be enthroned in our hearts. Now, a lot of us probably are a bit uncomfortable with that idea. We want a Jesus that we can mold into our image. I remember a friend of mine in college actually said that out loud to me. She had um, grown up in an Adventist Christian home and family, gotten a Christian education all the way through, and then left the church, and ultimately had um, rejected Christianity. And I was talking to her some years later and um, chatting, finding out how's your life going, what's going on, what's... She was attending a um, Episcopal church, as I remember. I said, oh, I wanted to hear more about that because I knew she'd rejected God. She says, yeah. She said, um, this congregation allows me to kind of create God that fits the needs of my own family so I can kind of create God that I need God to be for me. Oh, I think I just heard her say, I create God. Hmm? What's upside down about that? So a lot of times we do that, though. We want to we create God. We want to mold God into our image, something that's comfortable for us, not surrender ourselves to his will for our lives, but to ask him to make things comfortable and form him into our needs. But if you want to know the Jesus of the Bible, and if you want the Jesus of the Bible to be your king, you need to relinquish that throne and get off of it in your own heart and give it to him. How do we do that? Well, through prayer. Prayer is that constant connection with God where I can invite God to come in. You know, I, I, I hope that you do this. I, I do this a lot. Um, sometimes for the most mundane things, maybe I'm driving and the light turns green right before I get there, I'll just say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> now, that seems kind of ridiculous to you, but it's, it's this idea for me, this idea of kind of staying in touch. And so when good things happen, you know, Betty has heard me say this a thousand times, oh, I must be paid up on my tithe because this good thing has happened. And, but just constantly thanking God for whatever blessings come. And then when hardships come, difficulties, you know, um, now I've waited through three rotations of the light before I get through the intersection to be able to still say, Lord, I'm learning patience now. I hope you're happy about that. <laughs> but to be able to stay in touch, right? This idea of praying without ceasing is not on your knees with your hands clasped. It's just staying in touch with the Lord. Thy kingdom come. So we invite him through prayer 
um, when we find that we have just thought or done something that was um, rude, unkind, thoughtless, selfish, to be able to say, Lord, I'm, that's not what I want to be doing. Please forgive me for that. Maybe I need to ask a person for forgiveness. Then beyond prayer, um, just having an attitude of surrender and submission. That's what it is to have a king ruling your life, is to be in submission to that, being under that. We yield ourselves to him so he can live through us. He demonstrates his love, his grace, his mercy, his power in us and through us when we are surrendered to him. When we're sitting on the throne, he's not going to do that as much because you take the credit for it. And God wants us to be praising him and giving him the honor and glory. In Galatians, Paul writes, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. This is, this is the picture of full surrender. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For we are God's handiwork, the scriptures teach us. God's handiwork. By the way, if you are ever thinking about taking your life, don't do that. Think of this scripture. We are God's handiwork. You have been created in the mind of Christ and with his hands he has built you from the very beginning. You are God's handiwork. He has sculpted you. He has made you. You are worth something. Don't snuff that life out. Give God the praise and the glory for who you are. You may not think your nose is on your face just about right or whatever it is or somebody said something nasty about you. You are God's handiwork. Let's read on. You are God's, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we are here to be a blessing, to be a blessing to others. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Why does the scripture use that uh, terminology? Well, you and I, at the end of life, if we're buried, turn back into dirt over time, don't we? All of this that is so vibrant, full of energy and life, some of us more than others, all this that is thinking and aware and perceiving and touching and changing things around us, when we die, all of that turns back to earth, the clay. And so the Lord uses this imagery, imagery in talking to us and says, you have this treasure within. What is your contribution to it? You are a clay jar. God says, I have put my spirit within you. You have this treasure in jars of clay. That's you. And yet this treasure that is within you is that life-giving, amazing force that can make a difference, can actually change the population of eternity. That's because he wants to live in us and through us. Treasure in jars of clay that is this all-surpassing power from God and not from us. You know, <clears throat> I, I saw this and I just uh, uh, grabbed onto it and wanted to share it with you. The scriptures say, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? It says, no, to obey is better than sacrifice. Um, God set up the sacrificial system to remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus that was coming. Pretty soon the people just were doing it as a rote routine. They weren't worshiping anymore. They were just doing it out of blind, grandpa did this, dad did this, I'm going to do this. And so the Lord uh, said to us through our forefathers, to obey is better than sacrifice. You know, I was, I was sitting down in the Estacada church um, during children's story. I was just, do you ever do this? Do you ever just open your Bible and let your mind, your eyes just fall on a page and say, Lord, speak to my heart this morning? And this is the scripture that came, and I don't have it on the screen because it just happened. And it says this in Ephesians, uh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 14. For here, we do not have an enduring city. Here, we do not, do not have an enduring city. Look, the biggest cities, the most powerful places on earth, they are not enduring. They're temporary. Here, we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that has to come. This is the next piece, the prophetic piece, right? Talking for the city to come. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips 
that confess his name. Now, what it, let me just explain this a little because this just really spoke to my heart. Let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise. This is the kind of sacrifice that, that, that brings joy to God's heart. It brings a smile to his face. Don't ever think that what we do in church before the preacher gets up is preliminary to church. It's not preliminary. I've heard many people say, well, these are just the preliminaries. We can talk in the lobby because that doesn't matter. What matters is when the preacher gets up and opens the scripture and whatever. No. What does God say in his word? Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Church is about sacrifice. We've talked about that before. In the Old Testament times, people would come. They, they didn't sit down and, and uh, listen to a lecture from the Torah. They came to offer a sacrifice to cover their sins, the blood of their sacrifice to cover their sins. All church was was an offering. That's the whole thing. Every once in a while, somebody suggests, well, can we get rid of the offering? Just put a little box in the back. It's like you get rid of the very thing that church is. Church is about sacrifice. That's what church is. Maybe this preaching is preliminary. It's called foolishness. The Bible calls preaching foolishness. So let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. So when we are singing praises to the Lord, that is sweet sacrifice to God. He loves that. It puts a smile on his face. Do not forget to do good and share with others for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. That's Hebrews chapter 13. <clears throat> so John chapter 14 and verse 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So this is pure worship, right? Is we, we come and we enter into a surrendered, submissive relationship with God. That is worship. We praise his glory, his name, his goodness, what he has done. We express our thankfulness. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, this is what surrender looks like. Do what I've instructed you to do. So, yes, we look forward to the reign of Jesus in the future, but we are literally citizens of the kingdom of heaven now. We are citizens now. Now, that is good news for those of us that um, like staying in touch with what's happening in politics in our country, your citizenship is not here. It's there. Does that give you some kind of peace? You don't need to worry about what's going on here. God has taken credit for setting up kings and rulers and taking them down. Let God worry about it. Don't you worry about it. Don't be wringing your hands and, you know, standing on the street corner with a poster of your favorite, whatever. You don't need to do that. Your citizenship is not in this place. Your citizenship is in heaven now. We are wayfaring, wayfaring strangers. We are strangers in this place. Our home is heaven. Amen? That's where our citizenship is. And that's what we look forward to. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, we pray pervasive. That's the word that I choose, pervasive. It just means that we're looking for God's kingdom to be established outside of our own self and home. We want to see his kingdom grow around the world. And so this is evangelism and outreach and mission. We want to see God's kingdom established. When we pray, thy kingdom come, we get to help make that happen by funding missions, by going places, by encouraging others, sharing a Bible study, whatever it is. We're, we're um, passionate about seeing God's work grow in this world. And we want to see it advance in the world today. And we can have a part of seeing all of that happen, spreading the word. When you and I are convicted about how um, important it is to be a light shining in a dark place, there are lost and dying people in the world all around us. We, we begin to get a passion about doing something about that. And we go into the world, we spread the gospel message, we touch people. One of the things that, that I enjoy about the life that God has called me into right now is that I get to move people, maybe just an inch toward Jesus frequently. Just moving people, one conversation at a time, moving them toward Jesus. Let them be under the guidance and influence of the Holy Spirit for the next step. God will use somebody else to take them the next step. How often I just, my heart just rejoices and I, as I'm able to talk about the Lord to people that are not, they're not religious people at all. And they're coming to appreciate and acknowledge that God is alive and, and he's doing something in this world. So, um, when we're convicted, then we will have this great desire to see others saved. And um, we'll do what we can to help that happen. 
Mark chapter 16, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. Matthew 28, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the last part of that, see, God equips us. He doesn't just call us and then make us feel guilty for not accomplishing his calling. He calls us and then he equips us. He gives us the resources that we need to accomplish the mission that he calls us to. He promises that. Acts chapter 1 says you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. He's talking to people born, excuse me, he's talking to people in the first century, right? This goes way back to the beginning of Christianity. And he's telling them, you're going to be my witnesses here in the next county, in the next state, in the next nation, and around the world. Jesus is assuring them of that. But he doesn't just say, this is going to happen. He says, I am going to give you power. The Holy Spirit will empower you to accomplish this. Here are these large, largely uneducated. They've been educated by Jesus for the last three years. And Jesus is telling them, I'm going to take care of giving you the power that you need to accomplish what I'm calling you for. I am not ashamed, Paul says in Romans chapter 1. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. So the question we need to ask ourselves when we think of praying the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, is what are we doing to respond to that call? What are we doing to help the kingdom of God come to our world outside of our own um, self and our own family? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This prayer is also a prophetic prayer. You know, when you read the Bible, um, not only throughout the New Testament, but many places in the Old Testament, there are prophecies pointing toward the grand climax when Jesus comes again in the clouds, comes to bring his children home. There are promises throughout the scripture that there's going to be this future kingdom of righteousness on the earth. And so when we pray, thy kingdom come, we're asking our heavenly father to bring this kingdom to pass on the earth. We're asking God to fulfill all of his promises that his kingdom will come. I'd like to invite you to look at some of these promises with me in Isaiah ch chapter nine. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Last time we talked about all the different names of God. These are a bunch of them right here. Of the increase of his, go of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Promise of what the future looks like. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. In the time of the kings, you remember this image, Daniel chapter 2. Each uh, metal of this image represented a different kingdom. But at the very end of that prophecy, talking about, you know, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. At the end of all of that, the, the statue representing all these earthly kingdoms. He says, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it will itself endure forever. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. Talking about Jesus. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. And his kingdom will never end. That's the kingdom that's coming. One more. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. So just as certainly as the prophecies that, that, that foretold the coming of Jesus as a baby in Bethlehem, in a manger, at the time and place exactly that He was supposed to be, those prophecies are the same prophecies that also foretell the soon return of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. And since the first coming of Jesus was so clearly fulfilled. The second coming will be as well. There will be a day when his reign and his rule, his power and his glory will be set up here 
in this earth, his righteous kingdom will be established. Now, the future is going to be vastly different from any kind of nation or country or kingdom that we have observed on this earth. Um, no nation has ever existed on this earth that is going to be like the kingdom that God is setting up here. Why is that? Well, we're selfish people, led by selfish people. Um, it's always so curious to me how there's, you know, in, in our politics in this country today, um, people are shouting at each other how, how the other side is so immoral. And it's the, you know, pot calling the kettle black, I guess you could say. Everybody is selfish. Everybody has selfish motivations in this context, it seems. And they're just shouting at each other, you know, how you're so, you, you lie. And then, no, you lie. No, well, okay, we're selfish people. And um, earthly nations are tainted by this. They're tainted by this politic and selfishness and sin. Every earthly nation is. Um, but the promise of God's word is that the God of this age has blinded the minds of un unbelievers, right? Don't have your mind blinded right now. Don't, don't be confused about what's really going on in the eternal perspective of things. The Bible says they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So in this picture that I put together up here, we're not looking toward Jesus, right? We're looking in another direction. And those people are called blind people. They don't see what the reality of it is. The whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. We, over the last couple of weeks, have been sucking a lot of smoke here in Portland area because forests are burning down to the north of us, to the east of us, to the south of us. The earth is groaning. Uh, natural resources are being depleted, tapped out. And um, the world lies under this grip of sin. But you and I have the assurance that there is a new world coming. And that world is not coming because of who you mark on the ballot. And I, and I encourage you to be active in, in, you know, in, in our, uh, the freedoms that we have in our government. But there, we're not going to solve the problems by voting this political party or that. Amen? That's not the solution. And um, Jesus himself is coming and he will rule the world. Seventh angel, Revelation chapter 11. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. There was a loud voice in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. The kingdom that we're part of here is dominated by evil forces. Spiritual kingdom here is dominated by evil forces, but God has promised us that the kingdom that he sets up will not be overthrown, it won't be conquered, it will last forever and ever. So when we pray... Thy kingdom come. We are echoing the sound of all creation, voicing the great songs heard round God's throne in glory. And that is, and I'm, I'm just going to read you a few passages of Scripture. And can I tell you before I, this is the, the last Scriptures I'm going to be putting up in front of you. One of the things that I enjoy about preaching in, in the time that we live now and the first half of my ministerial career, we didn't have even access to some of this technology, but I enjoy getting, finding pictures on the internet to illustrate the things that we're talking about that make things a little bit more graphic and colorful and maybe a little easier for everybody to follow along what, what is being talked about. But these um, next passages from the book of Revelation, um, I, I looked on the internet for pictures that would describe what the scriptures, the 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 scripture's pain, and we'll invite the musicians to come up here and get ready for our closing time together. And I scrolled through, I Googled, and all kinds of different things, scrolling through, looking for photographs that might begin to capture what is in the future for us. I couldn't find them. There was nothing. So what I'm going to put on the screen for you is just the words. But for a moment, I, I want you to just... You may, you may even just want to imagine that you are there in the presence of God when his kingdom comes and what that will look, out, look like. Let's look at it together. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night 
they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every living creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. When we pray thy kingdom come, we're sharing the same desire that resides deep in the heart of God. We're praying that his righteous absolute rule might be realized on earth. And it is a noble prayer to pray thy kingdom come. And so let's pray thy kingdom come and join our voices with John as he says, even so, come Lord Jesus. Stand with me together as we sing. <laughs> 